This is Coombe Cathars for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. We're in Las Vegas here. There's people throwing hats here and everything. It's crazy. Um, crazy man. Wild, Wilder Fury Fight Week, joined by Steve Kim. Steve, how are you, mate? Hogan, great to finally do something with you, man. Big fan of yours. Been watching you for years. It's a great compliment coming from you, <laughs> Steve. We have been, we have known each other for years, and uh, to be honest. Yeah, it's the first time we're actually sitting down and having a chat, obviously. So, yeah, how's life in general? Oh, it's good. Can't complain. I mean, it's a big stretch going to uh, cover this fight. I was here Wednesday. I have to tell you, as an American fight fan, it feels big. You know, unprecedented coverage on two major platforms, two great networks. I think the heavyweight fight, I was at the fighter meetings earlier today. I have to tell you, both fighters, if you didn't know either guy and, and you were an unbiased observer, you could honestly state that you would think both fighters had an unbelievable self-belief and confidence that they were going to win the fight. It actually got me a little bit more excited for this fight than coming into this weekend. And then next week, I can't believe you're not going to be there. I believe top to bottom, the best card of the early calendar. And you're not going to be there, Coogan. Does Eddie know about this? It must be very disappointing for Eddie. Very <laughs> disappointing for Sir Edward Hearn. Eddie does know about it, but my guy Andrew McCart traveling all the way from here to there. He's going to have the whole week in, uh, in Texas next week. So it is a great card, you're right. And uh, um, a lot of kind of intriguing fights on that card as well. No, exactly. And I went to go see Roman Gonzalez, who I kind of wanted to pay homage to by going there. He's in the best shape I've seen him prior to a fight. You know, every time I covered a fight of his, the one thing you'd see at the fight hotel the week of the fight, him in the sauna. He kind of changed his life. I think the year off from the knee injury really did him well. And I get the sense that... He believes he's got one last really good chapter in his career. He wants to write it. He wants to not only win a title, and that starts with Califi, he feels as though there's opportunity here to make some real history and cement his place as the greatest small fighter ever. For the first time, he told me a couple weeks ago out there in Indio, Palm Springs, Secret set so wrong Vasai. He said he was checked out for the rematch. He said he'd like another crack at him. And for my money, I thought he beat him the first fight. So in my view, they're one-to-one. Mikey, Bar uh, Mikey uh, Garcia against Jesse Vargas in the welterweight contest. I actually think Jesse's a very live dog. He's a bigger guy, more natural welterweight. And a guy that I know that Eddie is very high on. I think might be the best pure prospect alongside Jerron Ennis and uh, Virgil Ortiz is Romadromov. I think he's spectacular, and he's going to be moved very, very quick. So the, I think boxing's in for a great run starting from this week on. If you look at some of the shows that are being planned out, Inouye against Casamero, that's going to be here. Tiafimo against Lomachenko will eventually uh, be worked out. Burchelt Valdez, I think, will happen in June. Postal Ramirez will be rescheduled. PBC will be rolling out some fights. The Zone always has good stuff. So I'm very excited. I think February 22nd this weekend, Coogan, is actually the unofficial start date of the 2020 boxing season. I would agree with that. There's some mouth-watering fights. And we're, we in England are kind of waiting for a lot of the heavyweight fights to be announced. It's like The expected fights like Joshua Povetkin and... and um, not Joshua Povetkin, sorry. Joshua Pulev, Povetkin White, Usyk Chizora. These fights we've got to look forward to in the UK over the next three months as well. No, and I have to tell you, I must be one of the few guys, it's funny, doing the various uh, media rounds for this fight. I think Anthony Joshua has been completely disrespected. And I really mean that. Look, he's the only guy that's actually out of the current heavyweights that's unified titles. In fact, no other current heavyweights that I know of that has a belt or has had a belt has been involved in unification bouts. Yet for some reason, it is naturally assumed the winner of this weekend is the best heavyweight, which I don't disagree with. But Anthony Joshua had one bad night. Now, I told this to another person. Don't we all consider Lennox Lewis an all-time great? Yes. Love Lennox. What a, what a lovely guy, by the way. Okay? Now, he had two bad nights. Oliver McCall and then Hassan Rockman. And in both fights, he won the rematches. Now, Anthony Joshua seems to be penalized for not being exciting or being overly tactical in the rematch in Saudi Arabia, which I don't disagree. But if you actually look at the resume and the strength of schedule, and we always talk about that, Look, it's hands down to me, Anthony Joshua does have the best heavyweight resume. Now, does that make him a favorite over either guy Saturday night? Maybe not for different reasons, but we can't have it both ways as observers and say, well, who you fight and who you beat matters, and then completely discount it with AJ. I, I find that odd. So I spoke to Tyson Fury a couple of days ago, and 
I put it to him that the winner of this Saturday night has a strong claim to being number one. Right. Still undefeated, and off, off the back of the two fights, you would say that. But can you truly call yourself number one unless the winner of this fight has fought Anthony Joshua? And Tyson Fury says, yes, you can without fighting Anthony Joshua. I would disagree. Look, belts matter. And Wilder is the WBC champion. There's no doubt about that. Fury is the lineal champion, although the lineage may have died during his two and a half years off. Part of having the lineage is actually extending it and fighting. Okay, because look, and I think he's an outstanding boxer, might be the best heavyweight in the world. Coogan, you try not to show up to your job for two and a half years, see if you still have that job. Okay, that, that's the two and a half weeks, <laughs> it'll be replaced. Right now, Anthony Joshua, one by one, has picked off belts. He fought a very, very soft champion in Charles Martin to win his first belt. From that point on, though, I think he's taken on the most top 10 heavyweights, according to Ring Magazine. Um, I think the key for Joshua, in my view, because he's obviously, I've said this even before the Ruiz fight, it wasn't the Ruiz fight that completely changed his style. It was a Klitschko fight. That baptism by fire, I thought really altered him. For the first time, he said to himself, I could really get hurt here. And he became more of a safety first type of guy. He wasn't just blowing through guys. He became a little bit more tactical, laid behind the jab. Um, and he worked his way into late knockouts. If he's going to continue to fight like he did against Ruiz, if every fight is a 12-round decision, he's going to have a real problem. Because at that point, it does become boring. We have to be honest about that. Aesthetics matter. Style points matter. But if he could start to meld what he had done previously to what he's doing now and have more of a finishing kick on the last half of fights and score some knockouts, because much like the Klitschko's, we what you want about Vladimir, a lot of his fights the first... Six to nine rounds were snoozers, we have to be honest. But you look at his actual knockout percentage, it's among the highest in all the boxing. So in heavyweight history, that's where I think the middle ground has to be really looked upon is can him and Robert McCracken evolve themselves and develop a certain style that is tactically sound, yet also at the same time stylistically pleasing for the public. It's, it's interesting because obviously it was much publicized that after the first uh, defeat to Andy Ruiz that changes were made in camp. We don't know exactly all those changes. We know that there were certain people brought in to kind of assist the team and, and Rob McCracken, but um, his performance against Andy Ruiz wasn't the prettiest, but it was effective and it was job done, which was really the main uh, case of going to Saudi Arabia and getting his belts back and coming home. When I used to do a podcast with Leave It In The Ring, I said two years ago, that the problem with Anthony Joshua that I had from a physical standpoint, I thought he looked like a guy that should have been on the cover of a bodybuilding magazine. I thought his lats and his traps were way too big. I mean, look, he looked great on the cover of a magazine, but I, I thought he did way too much military press. I mean, honestly, I would look at him and I'd go, boy, that's a sexy SOB. Not really, a, not really what I'd want my boxer to look like. And, and you saw what happened in the rematch. He was a much more streamlined guy. And he lost, in my view, prior to that first Ruiz fight, flexibility and fluidity. And he faced the wrong guy to do that. Because I was not one of those people that was completely stunned by that upset in June. Now, I may have been West Coast bias. I've known Andy Ruiz for years. I've known this. No matter how Andy Ruiz is built, Coogan, he's a fast, flexible fluid fighter. He actually can weave some, some of the most exquisite combinations I've ever seen. I've seen him in the year. I remember him as a kid 10 years ago, wild card. I'd work out there and I'd be watching him. I'm not going to lie to you. I thought him and David Benavidez were two fat kids trying to lose weight to stave off diabetes. I actually did not know that they were real fighters. And look where they are now. But Andy Ruiz, his worst trait is that I don't think he has great athletic character. He does not have a great work ethic. But him coming off the Povetkin fight April 20th, Jarrell Miller pops hot for all of a pharmacy, and he got the fight about two weeks later. That is a very, very underrated factor, that he didn't have time to get out of shape, and he was right in a certain rhythm, and Manny Robles did a great job of staying on him. And, and if you look at what Andy Ruiz can do in terms of hand speed and quickness in short areas, and look, if you go back to that first fight. Anthony knocks him down, I believe, with the left uppercut. So that fight looks over. 
Anthony rushes in. I've always said if Anthony just stays behind the jab and is, fights from a long distance, he may have just picked him apart. He never quite recovered from that one left hook on the temple. And I don't understand this with most fans. The result is the result. It doesn't matter what excuses, whatever legitimate reasons you have that you may have lost the fight. But it, is it really out of the realm of possibility that Anthony Joshua had a terrible camp or that he may have been damaged beforehand? It happens all the time. Most athletes will tell you in any sport, they're never 100%. And I still don't really know, and we've never gotten a complete explanation for Anthony Joshua's father basically wanting to assault Eddie Hearn. Eddie's a nice guy. Who'd want to beat up Eddie? Come on, come on, Mr. Joshua. That was wrong. That was wrong, man. I think uh, the aftermath of the defeat to Ruiz left a lot of unanswered questions, which is still unanswered. And I think Joshua has kind of sort of said in the past that he would explain certain things. What those certain things are, we don't know. But I don't think he's actually said anything. Everyone made the excuses for Joshua. He made no excuses right. about that fight himself. But everyone was like, you know, look at the ring walk and look at the way, you know, they were mess massaging his neck and look, look at his body demeanor. But he didn't actually come out and say anything. So we were left to our own judgments about what could have gone wrong in camp. That's going to be in his book. I can't wait to read it. That's going to be a bestseller. Let me go back. When Lennox Lewis lost to Rockman on South Africa, I'll, I'll remember very clearly, it was actually in this facility here, uh, three, four weeks before the fight, and I think we were here for Hamed Barrera. Right. Now, on that Saturday night, they had a special media gathering and held by HBO and the promoters of that fight. Rockman had been in South Africa, which I don't think anyone realized was high altitude. So he had been out there for a couple of weeks. Lennox was here filming Ocean's Eleven. And it was not a great camp. Emmanuel Stewart told me for years, like, ugh. I burnt two ends of the candle trying to train Hamed and, Hamed and Lennox at the same time in two different locations. He lost both fights. Probably the worst run that Emmanuel Stewart has as a trainer. And it left him very bitter because he learned a lesson. But... You, you fast forward a couple of weeks, Hassan Rahman had been in South Africa and acclimated himself very well to that altitude. If you go back to that fight, Lennox didn't look very good physically. He was huffing and puffing. Why? Well, he was filming a movie. And, in, and you, we all know what happened, and Larry Merchant had one of his all-time great lines. He said that Lennox drowned in Ocean's Eleven. Now, is that an excuse? Maybe. But I know one thing, it's the truth. So is there a reason? is an excuse, is an alibi. All I know is this, we all go to work at a certain point in our lives, we're not, we're, sometimes we have bad days at the office that are caused by real reasons. And I'm fascinated by Anthony Joshua now because he no longer has the burden of being undefeated. He's been punctured, but I've always respected his intelligence. He seems to have a very good self-awareness. He's a great face for boxing. He's probably the most valuable property in this sport alongside Canelo. And I think he's handled it very, very well. And I'm actually more intrigued now by the second and third chapters of his career moving forward. And I don't want to hear any excuses. I believe the winner of Saturday night, whether they fight a third time or not, I don't know. But they don't get to automatically anoint themselves number one while there's a certain guy out there with three belts. Because it wouldn't be allowed for any other division. We have to be honest about that. No, it, it's, um, it is an interesting point. And I get the winner of the fight on Saturday can say currently they're not, they've got a good they stake. Can they can one, but currently, they but a champion. I don't. I don't believe so. No, I, I really don't. In, in my view, Anthony Joshua still has the best set of victories. Now, if Tyson Fury, his argument would be if he won, I'm undefeated, and I took on a guy that somehow you didn't fight. Wilder can make the same argument. However. However, when was the last time you saw a situation in any division where one guy has three-fourths of the belt, but they say, yeah, but that other guy's the best guy? That, that doesn't make sense. Steve, who's got, out of Joshua, Fury, and Wilder, who's got the best two opponents on their record? Just the best two. Think about it. All right, so Fury has Chisora and Klitschko and Wilder, right? Those are the best three. So I would say Wilder, Klitschko. Wilder has Louis Ortiz and Fury, right? Yeah. 
So Anthony Joshua has Klitschko. Klitschko. Good question. You're right. So maybe the first two victories Joshua lacks, but the overall top ten yeah. victories, yeah. Yeah. it's the depth of victory. Yeah. So there's ways we could look at it. Yeah. And then, you know, guess what? I have a novel idea. They should settle it by fighting. Think about that's that. That's crazy. That's crazy. Not, we got to get out of here. We're, we're, we, we are nuts. You know? So I, I think there's an argument for all yeah, three the, guys. When you look at the depth of quality, if you, if you were to round up, like, say, a best 10 of opponents, I, I would say you would say Joshua's resume. No, no doubt. Yeah, would be, would be there. Um, but yeah, I was just picking out. It was t I was tailing to my own question, really. The top two, I'd say Fury has, has fought. Hasn't beaten, because he hasn't beaten Wilder right. yet, but names on records, the best two would, right. be, would be Fury, best two. But. Right, and so that's why they should fight. And it's interesting, Fury has said, uh, and he reiterated it today, he's got three fights left as soon as this ESPN. But, you know, we've heard that before. Um, but again, we are talking about a guy that took a two and a half year hiatus after beating. We're Klitschko. also talking about someone who said he was going to move to Australia and and, and live out there right. and, and have camp out there as well. Yeah. So I, I mean, again, money talks. Coogan, don't you think that a, a fight between Anthony Joshua and Fury for all the belts? Let's say Fury wins on Saturday, at a certain point within reasonable time, let's say a year, isn't that the biggest fight in UK history? That would be the biggest fight of our generation in the UK and I I couldn't imagine actually now would what be would be first, bigger. It would be the first time I can recall that the two stated heavyweight champions or the two best would be from Britain. I, I mean look there's always been a, a Lennox Lewis, a Frank Bruno, a Henry yeah. Cooper. There's never been two guys at one where you say they're, these are the two best guys. You know and I just I look we all work for different networks or different people and Sometimes you have agendas, but I, I just find it hard to overlook Anthony Joshua. Look, he had one bad night. He's allowed to have that. Um, but when you have three quarters of the belt and you gain revenge on the guy that beat you, look, you still should be given some respect. Do you know who I'd love to slip in this interview now would be Bob Arum? Because like, Bob Arum's gone on a, a rampage well, over, wait, over... Wait a minute. What are you talking about? The guy's nothing. He got flattened like a pancake. He's not a lead anymore. Okay, Bob, I get it. I get it. But I love Bob. We all love Bob. But Bob's biased. Come on. Come on. You know? I'd just like to hear the counter between you and, uh, and Bob in this, because Bob's like, yeah, been on the rampage about this Anthony Joshua thing, especially with no, the no, Pulev fight happened. coming up as well. Let's say they made, let's say, let's say they were somehow able to consummate Fury and Joshua, then Bob would be, these are the best two heavyweights in the world. <laughs> London Bridge is going to come falling down. This is what we've been waiting for. I mean, Bob, Bob's a chameleon, man. Bob's a chameleon. I mean, look, he'll sway with the wind, you know? So um, It's interesting because Eddie Hearn's always said that Bob Arum could be slagging him off in, in one breath and then he'll be on the phone in the other hand trying to make a deal. They have a yeah. fascinating relationship yeah. because it's funny because they actually work well together. Yeah. Matchroom and top rank, it's great for the sport. Um, I think we were in Dallas this past summer when Mo Hooker fought Jose Ramirez, and it was funny. They were they were working very well together, but at the same time at these press conferences, Bob would be like, "Eddie Hearn doesn't know jack about promoting in America." I, I was like, "He's right in his face." But and the, the thing that's great about Eddie, right, right, and they also did that one, but they also switched platforms. One guy went to one country or one region. Um, look. The biggest takeaway of this weekend is not going to who's going to win the fight. There's going to be a winner or a loser. <laughs> Maybe there might be a draw. Well, there might be a draw. Let me take that back. But I think the greatest thing is maybe a template was set, at least in our country, Coogan, that if fighters want the fight, like Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford, you can make the fight. It doesn't have to be like North and South Korea on the 38th parallel. People can come together, give peace a chance. You know, because I look, I see it all the time with Frank Warren and uh, Eddie. I don't, and it, it happened in Germany with the Sauerlands and another. It, look, the divisions in boxing to me are, are the biggest issue we have. It really is. Is that there's simply been in the past 25 years, if you really want to research it, too many fights that were bogged down by politics and promotional rivalries. That's the one thing that really irks me about covering this sport. 
Let me just um, finish off, Steve, by asking you your opinion on, on two different things. Um, Tyson Fury rumoured to be coming in tomorrow, or by the time this goes later today, uh, um, heavier than 270 pounds. Yeah. What do you think about that? And what do you also think about the commission barring the face-off today at the weigh-in? That's Bob Bennett. Just trying to make him feel important. Look, these guys are savvy guys. They're in on the joke. There is a WWE element to it. They know what they're doing. They're very calculated. And if you think either of these guys is dumb enough to throw away a $25 million plus payday to fight for free, I look, we were both at the final press conference when they're getting I never once thought it was gonna get out of control. This was not Jorge Luis Gonzalez and Riddick Bow, where they literally had to put plexiglass. I remember watching that as a kid when I was like a penalty box in hockey. So I, I was like oh, Herbie Hyde, Herbie yeah, Hyde. Yeah. Yeah. And no one glassed each other, like Derek Chisora and David Hay. I to me, look, these guys, they get it. They really do. They're very theatrical. I enjoy both of these guys. I really do. Um what was the other question again? Um, about Fury coming in heavier. Yeah. At first, I thought it was a terrible idea. I was able to see some of the shoulder programming on Fox. Now, you're closer to these guys than I am. I didn't know Tyson was doing so much weight training. The weight actually looks good on him. Uh, cut out Diet Coke, which I think is a very... I, the soda, to me, is worse than alcohol for a pro athlete on the body. Sugar Hill said something at the fighter meeting today to, to the broadcasters. He said, 15 pounds sounds like a lot, but this 15 pounds won't be like Andy Ruiz. And he said, look, my guy's 6'9". So there's a lot of distribution space. And Tyson was wearing a sports coat today. And so I didn't get to see his full figure, but he looked very lean. He actually looks very good physically. And did a lot of restaurant recovery, brought in a massage therapist, which I've been told most athletes should actually get one once a week. When I heard him talk, and I heard him talk about his reasoning for doing what he did, it's actually pretty sound. Uh, he has me really questioning my pick, to be honest with you. Because there's so much groupthink. You know, I've, I've said this, Coogan, when a rematch occurs, the cliche has always been, go with the boxer over the puncher. But if you canvass the opinion of most of the people, even the boxing people that I know of, most people are picking uh, Wilder, which is which is... Really interesting to me. It's not as close to the split as I thought it would be. But uh, Fury, to me, when I had seen him at the first two functions for this fight, I almost wondered if he was into it. He looked very subdued, almost out of it, almost disinterested. But this particular week, he looks like Tyson Fury. He, he does look like the Gypsy King. Looks like a guy ready to win a heavyweight title couple of days and uh, we will find out. It's going to be a, a great night here in uh, Las Vegas. Something about the MGM. I know we've got the T-Mobile Arena now and there's another stadium being built or whatever, but something about the MGM isn't there that just feels like this is the stage. Yeah, not only that, we can all stay here and just walk. We don't have to take a bus. <laughs> Let's just be honest, the convenience part of it. Also, the T-Mobile is the most expensive arena. A bottle of water costs 38 bucks. Folks, I'm not paid that well. Not making that Stephen A money. I'm making Steve Kim money. Um, so I'm glad it's here. Look, I think this is the 14th heavyweight title fight here. And there's something to be said about this venue because it's so historic. And also the atmosphere. When we walk here throughout the night, on that night, everyone's kind of congested in that area. You get a lot of stuff done. You know what's interesting? Uh, Tyson brought it up earlier today. He said, if we have a third fight, there's a new football stadium being brought up. That would be a perfect way to christen that venue. You know. Is that the Raiders? Is it the Raiders? The Las Vegas Raiders, I believe it'll have about 75 to 80,000. And my understanding is they will be doing boxing here and there. That's been one of the issues with the real big super fights. That every time Dallas Cowboys Stadium and Jerry Jones wants to bid on it, he puts in a very big bid. The problem is he doesn't have slot machines and casinos. He doesn't have uh, roulette tables. But the the downside is the fans can't get tickets. Now with that new yard being built, and it's coming along very well, certain fights fit right in. Look, I think if Pacquiao fights Conor McGregor, and I'm hearing rumblings that might actually happen, that would be a perfect venue for that. So it's, it's an exciting time for boxing. What I'm hoping for, regardless of who anyone's predicting or what might happen, I hope we have an honest-to-goodness heavyweight fight. Because we have to be honest, the first fight I thought at the Staples Center was much more interesting than actually entertaining. It, it was very, very tense. You're, you're kind of watching it. 
knowing something might happen, and a lot of times nothing happened, but it was still interesting because of the threat of Deontay Wilder and the drama of this guy coming off this long layoff, really riddling the superior offensive force, and he had the great ending. But, you know, when, look, when people say this is one of the all-time great heavyweight fights, no, it wasn't Bo Holyfield one. It really wasn't, but it was very interesting and intriguing. I hope this time around, for the sake of the sport, because it looks like it's going to play to a very significant audience, the best thing that these guys can do for the sport of boxing, have a great fight. Give people their money's worth. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to say that there will be a, a controversy that will occur on Saturday night. I think it's an inevitable that something controversial uh, will occur. I'm going to bet it's not a guy flying in on a parachute. I don't think it's <laughs> done. Gonna, that, that's not going to be. That's not going to happen here, huh? Something will happen. Just we'll replay this back. Okay. Something will happen which will cause. It, 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 I have that feeling for this fight, but we'll see. Yeah. But uh, we would like to see a conclusive well, winner. This, Let's say Tyson again clearly wins eight, nine, ten rounds. But somehow is not given the decision. Who's the best heavyweight? Is that, they go back to the result or the actual reality of what happens. It's fascinating. Then we do see a third fight. We would, wouldn't we? We would. We would. Steve Kim, thank you very much for your time. Uh, much appreciated. It's, um, absolutely appreciated. Glad we got it going. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully catch a word of you after the fight comes Saturday absolutely. here in Vegas. Look forward to it. Thanks, you.